conceptual Jay sounded better than Jay Prince. People talk Real about talk, it. I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements. Blanchard, I mean, just people who are boots on the ground. Right. And a lot of them do it silently. You don't know what they're doing, but they're there. And I guarantee you the enemy knows that there. The enemy is watching. And, I, you know, I just wonder, you know, we'll be talking about Darren. We'll be, you know, I mean, we'll be talking about it. There'll be a lot of posts on social media for a few days. Then everybody will go back to business as usual. But even while you're talking about it, my question is, for those that had a chance to impact what that brother was doing, how many of you did it? How many of you got behind him and other than liking posts and sharing posts or articles that may have been written about the work he was doing, what did you actually get involved and do? Mike, man, we had that conversation. And it seems like we both got hit by a ton of bricks, not only because of what's happened to Brother Darren, because we, we talk about this target on our backs all the time. Right. But just being in a situation where you find yourself, you wake up some days, man, and you've put everything you've had into something. And you can't see it. You can't see the appreciation. You can't see the unity. You can't see where you see people benefiting because they're currently coming to you telling you they need your services. Right. They're currently telling you how awesome you are and how well, how proud they are of you. But our people refuse to get behind those who are willing to step out there. And I look at this brother, and he gave everything. And I wonder how much of that outside of the people he actually helped and touched. But how much of that it actually hit home the way it needed to? I mean, how you? I mean, how are you feeling at this at this particular moment? Man, um, right now I'm, I'm I'm in a in a hurtful place. I'm I'm not gonna even. You know, that's I'm, I'm in a very hurtful place, um, and it's more so not because of what happened or how it went down. Because, like you say, we understand that when we're doing what we do, like we we, we do become targets. But I'm more so in a hurtful place because our people, man. It, to me, it just don't seem like we really truly appreciate the sacrifices that are being made by the ones who step out there and put it all on the line and and you know um i was sitting up last night man it was like one o'clock in the morning and I'm, and I'm reading over this story again and i'm just like man like this dude had family you know he had loved ones he had you know, people who loved him, people who would want to see him here. But at the same time, with even with that, like, he chose to fight the good fight to the end. And, to, I mean, it, it's just, it really just, it, it does something to me when we have our people, the people that we fight for, the people that we love, the people that we go to war for, and... It's like, man, you you can barely even get a thank you. You know what I'm saying? Like you, 
Um, I mean, we talking about a dude that was, like you say, boots on the ground, actively in the community, you know, buying Christmas gifts, always the first one on the line. I mean, the first one sing like, this is what we're talking about. The impact that he had in Ferguson and, you know, just from everybody who knew him, like it was undeniable that dude was putting in work. He was, he was doing it. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, man, when, when we don't, we can say all day long, you know, job well done, pat him on the back and this and that, blah, blah, blah. but when you don't support the people who's constantly, constantly working on your behalf, I just think that that is like the biggest slap in the face ever. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right, right. You're talking about a 29-year-old brother, man, uh, that's been taken away from his family. Right. But he stood for what he believed in. And and I talked about this uh, a lot lately. And it really upsets me, it bothers me that we don't have enough black men right. that are willing to stand up and put it all on the line. Uh, we have a, we have more black men telling Co Colin Kaepernick to take stand down. To, to, to stand down and, and, and comply than we do have black men ready to step up. Man, I was so proud to watch Shannon Sharp. Man, uh, uh, to hear him just sit up and call it exactly <laughs> like it is that it just it it, it, it gave me. I mean, it, it it refueled me, man. I've been really drained lately, right? And because I go to war on this, man, and like. I shared yesterday, and we're going to go, go, go to break, I shared yesterday about what, what Baby said to me, man, and, and how it moved me so much, because I'm in such a place where it's a war, it's a battle, and she watches me, right. she looks at me, right. the kids look at me, man, and I said, kids, you know, I'm talking about adults and the younger kids, they're looking at me, and, and this dude, do you ever stop, do you ever take a break, you know, seven days a week, I'm at it, 105 hours a week minimum, I'm at it, and I'm going, and I'm looking at her, and it used to be a time that we would sit down and talk about my life. Right. And the fact that I may not live to a full life by, by what most people consider a full life. And she she used to be like, don't say that, don't say that, don't right. say that. And now even she stopped saying it. I don't think, I think she believes that I'll live a full life and she, that's what she wants to see. But she's already understanding this is this man's passion. I stood up and watched him do it. He lived, breathes, and bleeds it. And that's who he is. And because of that, she stands. Right. She stands because... You know, I know where he's at every day. Right, right. I know what he's doing every day. And sometimes it's hardships because of us, because he's out there pouring into them. But that's who he is, and I, that's who I said I was going to be with, and that's who I'm with. Man, hold hold on. It's time to go to break. Okay. It's that. all yours when we come back from break. Okay. Yeah, man, I don't think they understand, like, the, bur like, the burdens, man. That you care. That's a future we can trust. They don't, they don't understand. You know, Be um, bright. Let your light shine. Join us today. You're not talking directly into the mic. Favorite. That's what your problem is. You, you talk above the mic. No, you need to put it up to your lip. Yeah. You talk above it. You are so all your force go above the lip. Well, it's like you got to do it like a studio mic. 713-789-0153. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, but others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know oh, so it's not supposed to be in your everyday. Like so protect your everyday. If you see something suspicious, oh, well, say well, something well, to local well, authorities. He said, thank God for a, a really successful procedure, God right. is good, yeah. anesthesia is pretty awesome been too. Fascinated with how pictures so normally you get people, people that's kind of heavy so when and they get ready to do the their gastro bypass surgery, the doctor we wants to make them lose a certain amount of weight before 
you don't yeah, have to the things that they're sharing in life. I was just assuming that's why he was down there working so hard. Oh, that's the thing. You can with family and friends for generations. That's what collagehairs.com does. No, 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 this is all right. He is playing down here. We're going to let Ben Arco tell the story. He wrote a best selling book on his failures before climbing the ladder of success. You're guaranteed to love these stories. The Wizard of Common Sense is an inspiring, don't miss it book. It's available now for $24.99 at BackRVets.com. With every book purchased, a portion goes to help veterans and families in need. Visit BackRVets.com now, a nonprofit charity to back our vets. Hey everybody, this is TK, and I want you to tune in every Saturday at 12 p.m. here at the Bridge Light Radio for the happy hour. You're feeling down, feeling low, you might be feeling good, it can help you feel better. So I want you to tune in every Saturday at 12 p.m. here at the Bridge Light Radio, the happy hour with me, your host TK. Look forward to talking to you. Brought to you by hashtag we are here. People power that empowers people. Why ain't that be? <laughs> yeah, oh, I had to get my happy hour real quick. You're listening to the Bridge of Light Radio Network, where conversations lead to real change. And we are back. Mike, before we went to break, you were about to uh, weigh in on the weight that we carry with us on a daily basis when we are struggling and looking at our people suffering and our, our, our brother warriors laying down their lives and the indifference that comes along with that from the very people that we are fighting for. Right, right. And like you say, man, I just really wanted to let the listeners out there know that if, if you've ever been passionate about anything and you see that the very thing that you are passionate about is not functioning in the manner that you believe that it should or what it's capable of, along with that, man, it comes a very very heavy heavy burden and I, I, I was talking to you doc this morning and I was just kind of sharing with you man that like the, the burden is, is is so heavy man because you're constantly with everything that you're already doing and got going on in your own personal it's like your people man they are continuously dumping stuff on you and just giving you theirs and it's like you know you take it on and it's like man even if you're just barely moving and dragging everybody's burdens that's almost what it feel like and and i really want you know i want our listeners to understand that i re i feel that you know god only gives certain things to certain people like he's not supposed to give you nothing that you can't handle you know what I'm saying? So when I was talking to you this morning, we was just pouring out to each other. Like, I, I, I want you to understand that the reason that you are where you are and I am where I am are, are the position that we're in to be able to even carry the burdens is because we're strong enough to do it. Not just us, but everybody that's out there Hello. who's carrying the burdens of our people. Everybody can't Hello. do it. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. Everybody cannot carry the burdens of their people because I'm, I'm, I'm telling y'all one one day carrying some of these <laughs> burdens and you'll be like man I'm out you understand what I'm saying I mean let's let's let, let's just talk about one thing one thing that we you and I both we did right there's an entire community in southeast Houston uh, uh Sunnyside of South Park uh especially near Appleton Apple Thomas Middle School where there's an entire community that's basically with parents squatting right in uh, condemned buildings, no running water, no electricity, and they're getting their kids dressed and sent to school on a regular basis. Um, that was a program when you first did this the first time you worked and made sure that these people had groceries right. and food and they took the stuff home. But you didn't know at the time the severity of that situation <laughs> to even understand that they were gonna get home and they wouldn't even be able to keep the food you had gave them because they didn't have the electricity right. to run the refrigerator. Right. So they didn't have the stove to cook it. Mm. And this is what we deal with on a daily basis. We deal with that. We deal with going into communities where little boys as young as 11 years old have come to a point where they don't see right. any value in themselves. And because they don't have a sense of identity and they don't see any value in themselves just like them. And so it's real easy for them to pull the trigger, much less understand what it took for them to even get to that particular point. 
Right. And see, what happens with us, you know, with me having done thousands of hours of research in African-American adolescent and young adult male violence to understand how we get here and understand what needs to be done, I understand the trauma and place that brings a young boy right. to a point to where taking another life is absolutely nothing to him and what it will take to bring him back. And I feel the pain of that right. because it takes a heart for that to stand in there because every time I go out and deal with them, my life is on the line right. because they could go off at any minute about anything. The moment they see me as an enemy, I've got to defend me right. or I'm out of there. Right. So I'm going to either be dead or I'm going to take the life of another of a young black brother, which is one of the heart, most heartbreaking things to even consider. But that's the life we live daily. Right. And so when we talk about carrying this burden, people look especially people who read the stuff that I post, I'm talking specifically about me, the stuff that I post on uh, social media, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Pinterest, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, people say, oh man, that's profound, that's hot, I, they like it. You know, I've even seen some people sharing it, claiming it, which doesn't, doesn't really bother me, you know, right. do, do, do what it is, it's getting out there. Right. But hey, check this out. What you don't understand behind the statement is an experience. Behind what I post is an experience. It's not just what I've read. Uh, one of one, another brother that I consider a brother. I mean, literally a brother is is my other Mike, Michael Blanchett. Right. And Mike and I have talks, man. And Mike get to, get to talking about things. And Mike is is extremely insightful, highly educated, very aware. And he's talking to me. And man, and some of the affirming words and uh, and affirmations that this good brother speaks about what I'm doing and where I'm at. I'm like. How does he possibly even know that's where I'm at or that's what I'm feeling or that's what I'm going through? But he understands it and he knows it. And the reason Mike knows it is that for 10 years as a police officer, right. he fought for the rights of blacks and was his life was threatened and his family uh, threatened as he's on the front line standing. And so he understands what this is about. But what I'm encouraging my brothers and sisters to do is to come from behind the veil. Come from behind the veil and put your hands on the situation so that you can feel the pulse of the community. Well, I honestly, I to everybody that's listening right now, I think my question that I really want to know today is, do we even really care? <laughs> like that, that right there is 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 really the question that I want to pose on today. Do we really, Bruh. really care about the plight of our, our race, about the future of our children, about the conditions of our communities? I mean, because my thing is, and, and I'm just, when you care about something, when you care about someone, somebody, like they're going to know that. They're going to be able to feel that. They're going to be able to sense that. And, and and my thing is is that I mean I, we're I you know we're I and we're in the communities and, and we're working and we're doing everything that's in our power to do and I'm just kind of looking at the pulse of, of the community and I'm like man do do they do do we care do like I mean that I, I I mean and I mean in all, first of all you have to understand man to, in order to have survived what we have survived. We have to have developed a certain level of indifference, a certain level of callousness, and a void of emotion and feeling as a protective mechanism against this perpetuated trauma. And that is actually a part of the pathology of our behavior, is that it is a survival mechanism of multi-generational multi trauma. It is the perpetuation of a learned behavior that is reinforced by re-injury. In other words, slaves who were released were traumatized, untreated. And being that they were traumatized, there are certain behaviors that come along with traumati being traumatized. Well, those behaviors also influence the behaviors of the progeny, the children, the offspring. That comes from understanding social learning theory. 
that says that we learn in our environment by those who are in our environment. Right. You know, and so we are passing on the behavior as a, a learned behavior, but we're also creating a perpetuated, elevated or aggregated trauma because re-injury is also happening at the same time. It's not like we were released from slavery and everything was great and all was good. We were released into reconstruction, into slave codes, into black codes, into Jim Crow, into redlining, into urban renewal, into gentrification, into mass incarceration. And now we're starting to cycle over where police shootings of black men is now the new lynching. It's not meant to diminish numbers, it's meant to terrorize. It's, with, it's meant to send a message. And we're experiencing all of this in a state of learned helplessness or vicarious learned helplessness, meaning we've watched over and over again blacks try to rise up and make a, make a statement and get, and, and get quashed or get, get squeezed or get pushed down. And so we've learned that no matter how hard we push, we've learned it doesn't mean it's a reality, but it's a learned I, I, I ideology that we can't win. This, this, this is the thing. And, and I agree 100% with what you just said. I think we we all know that there's levels to it. We we all we, we get it. Right, right. Um, you have some people who literally the conditions that they're in is just it's nothing that they can do with the hand that they're dealt, but just try to survive. And I get it. Then there's those of us who we have figured out a way to kind of maneuver through all of the, and we doing okay. And in your book, you was talking about the dangers of the illusion. And I was reading it last night, man, and it was just, it, it, it was just really just speaking to me because, and I've said this before, you have a group of us who we feel like or we think we've made it <laughs> and it's like dude no because the vast majority of our people are still all the way down at the bottom of the food chain and i'm not trying to separate myself from i'm not saying oh well yeah i'm i'm here and my people is here but they just gonna have to be if they down there then guess what? I'm down there with them. Right. And and I and I say that because when I say do we care, but I'm talking about the ones who semi sort of have figured it out. Like I see how they're passionate about other things. It may be sports. It may be money. It may be their jobs. It may be whatever activities, extracurricular activities they do. It, I mean, it could be a plethora of things where you're passionate enough to spend time doing it, spend time learning of it, spend money or invest in care. That's more so for the ones of us who, again, like I stated earlier, have semi-figured this thing out. Well, 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 first of all, what you have to understand, man, is that, and this is real, we're gonna keep it real, as we always do, but we're gonna keep it real. The first thing you gotta understand is, to navigate this system, there has to be a certain level of assimilation. What I can tell you is this. As an athlete and as a businessman, most of my dealings were with white people. Right. Uh, or non-blacks. Right. Uh, even when I would try to integrate blacks into my workings and teach them the business, they were fighting me on it. Right. So I found ease in dealing with, I learned how to deal with white people. And what I learned, why this is what I, fight, why are they fighting you though? Why, why that's a part of the psychopathology. The thing is, you've been conditioned, and that's the thing we have to understand. And I think, you know, we talked about this a little bit the last time uh, that we sat down. What you have to understand is, when, when you have a conditioned mindset of thought uh, and how you see things, the paradigm that is set by that or uh, the lens through which you view life mm -hmm. is not a reasoning or a mechanism of reason. In other words, by you coming up and saying, hey, bro, this is why you're where you're at. If you just do this, this, and this, you'll come out of it. That's not going to work because it moves against the conditioning. The conditioning is deeper, it's stronger, it's more powerful, and you have to deal with the conditioning. The only way you change, for instance, like I, I think I used the same anal analogy last time. You get an agent who is a secret agent over in some other countries, a spy, gets caught, and they spend years brainwashing him to right. believe that he should be working for them because they're going to replant him into your system 
with you believing that he is still a U.S. agent, but he's actually now a double agent because he's been turned. Right. He's been turned is a is a term is a, he's been turned is a term that's used to say he's been brainwashed to move for the other side. Well, when you get him back and you discover he's been turned, you can't just tell him, "Hey, brother, you're not really working for the Russians. You're still working for us. Snap out of it." It doesn't work that way. You got to go back and undo what they've done. And it took them three years to get him there. It may take you three years to get him back of intensive therapy that reverses what they did. Well, you're talking about generations of conditioning to believe this is who we are. This is how we operate. Like I told you, we are taking uh, pathological behavior and defining it as culture. When you define pathological behavior as culture, you are sitting up and normalizing the, the abnormal. Man, but I mean, we're talking about, we're, we're, we're th let's think about it. So while I can, and, 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 and Michael, I was talking to Michael right. uh, Blanche, and, and we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, and I made the statement, it may have been a three, three or four weeks ago, and I made the statement that black people are the most comfortable, uncomfortable people in the history of mankind. And it kind of, he, he, he took it and he ran with it. But 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 the truth of the matter is that comfort in the midst of uncomfort is what we had to create for ourselves in our mindsets in order to survive. Because what happens is the moment that you actually become conscious and you actually start to make movements, you found out that what you thought was an easy route of maneuvering and manipulating your way through the system has become extremely difficult. Things you used to be able to get to get done with a phone call. Right. Now you got to push through walls because you are no longer a friendly, a friendly. Right. You are now a hostile. Right. And now you are viewed by the system as a hostile and things change. Right. And the, this is the thing. Those of us who were smart enough to figure it out, right. to maneuver around, know what that means. Right. And not everybody's ready to take on that difficulty. It's easy to talk about it, but when you actually talk about getting out there and doing it, you know I'm going up against something huge. I'm going up against somebody that has the capacity to pick up a phone call and, and, and end it. But, but you're going up against it knowing that I'm, I'm fighting against potentially saving my baby from being shot dead in the street and being left out there for three hours. See, when, Man, when, 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 okay. I, when I start thinking about it, I have three children and it's nothing on this earth that I will not do for mine, to protect mine, to ensure, or try my best to ensure that the things that I'm seeing and reading about does not happen to my children. So when I start, when I really just start thinking about it, it's like, dude, we, we talking about police brutality and just, just horrible. We talking about police actually taking, I mean, you got police that's actually coming out, retired police officers, and they're basically coming back and saying, how many people that they actually locked up, they framed them, they put the drugs on them. We got people that's mass incarcerated that have been locked up for 10, 20, 30 years behind something that they never ever did. So when you when, when I'm thinking about it and when I'm looking at and I'm looking at what it is that we're fighting against, it's like man, I don't no amount of money, no amount of comfortability, whatever you want to call it, will be able to stop me from saying, you know what, I don't care what y'all do, I don't care how y'all come at me, I'm going it, it's, it's it's going down. I'm going to show you how the illusion of inclusion and the conditioning that goes along with it contributes to what you can't you can't fathom because you are operating in a purpose and a passion you have a level of, of, of understanding of self there's something inside of you that was probably passed on to you by your father who had it passed on to him by his father that says when you believe in something you stand for it. see one of the reasons that as I became enlightened about who I was and the history of my people beyond slavery right. that I did not change my name was because there was a man by the name of C.D. Wallace who wore that name my great-grandfather who was also my adopted father and the way he carried himself and the things that he done and the unapologetic way that he spoke what he believed to be truth right was so much that I identified with that and that is who I identify with and so I kept that in the honor of him because he took something that wasn't his and gave it a more powerful uh, p 
powerful identity than the person who gave it to him, his, right. the slave master of his father. Now, 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 with that being said, what, what you got to understand is if you want to kind of understand this outside of what we are seeing, look at the fact. Look, look, I've been talking about rape culture right. for a while. I've been talking about depression for a while, but let's talk about rape culture. There's always something in the news that puts rape out there. And you can look at the conversation of black men specifically when it comes along that, along that lines. We live vicariously through those who we feel who have attained or achieved. And whether it's Bill Cosby, whether it's uh, uh, Nate Parker, whether, whoever it is, when we see that, when we see whether it's mystical, where, whether, whoever it is, and their name pops up in a circle uh, with, with, with rape on the inside of the circle, we don't draw the line across it. It's, it's real simple. When you got something inside of a circle, when you draw a line across it, you're saying you're against that or no. Or that, that that is not acceptable. Right. And, but but we, we 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 tend not to. We we find a way and an excuse to justify or at least marginalize something that's so important to our women. Now, am I sitting up saying I'm like this, brother? If you get caught with your pants down raping a woman, frankly, I don't even care what color she is. Right. I don't have any respect for you. Right. Now, if she's a sister. I want you out of here. Right. I mean gone. I don't mean the prison. I mean gone. Right. Because you are a threat to our people when you don't respect our women. Right. And you and then you're talking about incest. So you're not just doing it to grown women. You are assaulting and traumatizing young children. Now here's the thing. Go back and look at the threats. My thing is, as far as like the whole thing with Nate Parker, my thing is I'm grown enough to understand the need for a movie that talks about something that we haven't really seen talked about on a grand scale. But I'm also smart enough to go back far enough and watch this uh, and look at what was going on. A lot of people had uh, came up and, and the thing is you and Artem Ra had this conversation so you and I looked at, okay the brother was acquitted and the primary reason the brother was acquitted because they put the victim on trial. Point blank, point simple. You slept with the dude, you were pr promiscuous so whatever happened, happened. The other dude got convicted, but then they came back and I think uh, it was overturned because of poor counsel. And then so they didn't even retry him. So basically she went off and into the sunset with no justice and she ends up killing herself. But when we go back, the point is, dude, even if she was having consensual sex with you, what's your boy doing in the room? You let him in there to do whatever he did. To me, you just as guilty as he is. Now, I can still separate that from this movie that's been done. If we need to move, we need to move. Plus, here's the thing. We defending a brother that's trying his best in every way possible to be white. We ain't even defending. This man's married to a white woman. Mm -hmm. Had a chance to sell that movie to a black company for more money. Sold it to Fox. Fox searched like Fox. Rupert Murdoch. The biggest racist of the racist in media. You either an agent or you really trying to assimilate. So I don't have any, I don't, my whole thing is I'm watching, I'm not just looking at the fact that they coming after this dude about the movie. If you boycott that movie right now, you're not boycotting Nate Parker. Nate Parker got $17.5 million and sold it to them. Now that from what I've heard, they've already cut out any parts where black people kill white people in the movie. But y'all... Just because he's a black man, right. got to go stand up for him. My thing is, if he's a black man and he's not performing like a black man, I have nothing for him. And, and he's just a person I'm using right now. My whole thing is, he did a movie, from what I understand, the movie was unbelievable. But he sold it to people that gave them the rights to gut that movie. He eating now. He's eating now and he's taking his lead from their PR people on how to handle this particular situation. That, that, that's who feeding him what he's saying and what he's, his response is to it. My thing is, again, when you are sitting there in a situation with a woman, she's drunk as hell, and you're having sex with her, that happens. You go to clubs or you go to school. Right. I've been to college. Right. Right. You get drunk. Both of y'all drunk. Right. Y'all doing something. But I don't care how drunk you get. You cannot let your boys come in there while she's drunk. And I, I mean, I've been out there. I was a young cat man. In sports, I've, I've been out there. I've never participated in any type of group thing because you're not going to pull me into something that after a person comes to their senses, realizes what they actually consented to 
will not turn around and flip out and go, you know what? I didn't do it. I didn't tell them they could do that. I My whole thing is this. This is more important, and this is why rape, rape culture, dealing with rape culture is so important to me. We're so disconnected as black men from our black women. They don't trust us. And whenever time they bring something of concern to us, we marginalize it. We handle them rough, we talk to them crazy, we blame them for everything. Rape culture is real. It's one of the most destructive forces in the black community. Because see, right. in, you talk, when you talk about 60% of black women having been molested before the age of 18. 60%. Those are the ones who actually reported it. That lets you know the culture. Now we know where we got it from. Right. We know where we learned that from, but that doesn't change the fact that that's what's happening. If there is no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. That African proverb rings true on a daily basis as we watch the inside implode. We watch the inside refuse to work together. We watch the inside practice disunity and disruption. We watch the inside have man against woman and woman against man. And you wonder why we can't get anywhere? That's why. We have enemies on the inside, the elephant in the room, and nobody wants to talk about it. We want, to get, we want our women to get somewhere, shut up, be still, and be quiet. And then we wonder why we have no spiritual elevation because you sit, you spent your spiritual source over to the corner to sit down and be quiet. Man, and, but, and, and, the, and the bad part about it is exactly what you're talking about right now. We do that on all levels. It's like, you know, we have this thing where we want to take any and everything that we feel uncomfortable with and we got this thing where we want to brush it up under the rug right, and, and right. pretend like it didn't happen or it done as this and 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 i say this all the time that is one of the biggest problems that i have with the churches and you know we talk about this all the time <laughs> to whereas man you have the the actual leaders who are in all type of violation and doing all type of things and the people who's following them are the flock i would call it they see and know and understand what's happening and you refuse to address it or bring it to the forefront or deal with it. The Eddie Long situation. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you a bishop, you got all these people following you, yet you molesting little boys and doing all this type of stuff. And even with people knowing this, y'all still back and support what's happening and what's going on. The same way with the, the, the rape situations. And I don't even know all the extent of the Nate Parker situation because I have read no transcripts or none of that. But I find it, I mean, the thing that bothers me the most is that we have become a, 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 a culture of people who don't like to deal with anything that makes us uncomfortable. And I I, actually, I'm totally different because I'm, I'm, I'm that dude that, dude, whoever, whatever, whenever, wherever. Hold on, we got, we got to go to break. Hold that. Because it's something that I want to touch on that I know that was a big issue with you. And you talked right. about it a while. And, and I, I want to hit on that. And then we're going to segue into the final segment of the show. But we'll be right back after we pay these bills. Right. And see, when I was paying attention to what, what you was talking about with Nate Parker, I want to get on that because right. that was a valid point. My thing is, while I have an issue with Nate Parker, if you notice, I never really weighed in on it because I separated him from the movie. Right. Uh, Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick Wallace of the Odyssey Project. I uh, just want to stop by briefly. I hope that you enjoyed the video that you just watched. I just want to take a brief moment to talk to you about something that I'm extremely excited and uh, proud of, and that is the Black Man Lead Initiative. Uh, what the Black Man Lead Initiative is, it is a, right, a universal rite of passage for young black males. All other uh, enclaves and groups and races have some form of a rite of passage in which young black males are, I mean, well, in any in case, young males are trained, uh, taught, conditioned, and um, uh, prepared for manhood uh, to represent that particular group, that particular race in a certain way. Uh, we do not have a universal rite of passage. We don't have proper training. And when you talk about 1.5 million black man, black males missing, black men missing in the black community, there's this big gap, this big void 
uh, an absence, a lack of male presence, and it's showing in the generations of black men that are coming up and are wayward. We have excessive violence. We have disrespect of black women. We have failure to take care of our progeny. We have uh, a lack of purpose, a lack of direction, a lack of sense of self, no real true sense of identity. All of this comes from a lack of racial uh, proper racial socialization uh, that's taken care of normally in the home and it's done through a process of rite of passage well when the father isn't in 75 percent of the homes and then men in the community are missing whether it's for mass incarceration whether it's for uh, death by violence or simply a number of other different things like drugs like simple abandonment uh, whatever the situation is we have to create an environment that is conducive for black young black males from the age of four to 13 really truly being taught and, 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 and conditioned early on what it means to be a black man what expectations they must meet what standards they must live by how they treat a black woman how they treat their children how they protect the community instead of terrorize the community all of that's done within the confines and constructs of racial socialization this particular situation is uh dire at this point so uh i after years of studying and understanding exactly where a lot of the causality comes from as far as the waywardness and the behavior of african uh, american adolescent and young adult males especially in the way of violence uh, I have created this program and so far the program is doing great, but the program needs to be expanded. It needs to be nationalized. It needs to be broadened and scaled out. And I'm asking for your support. The link to support this program, along with any other programs that are associated with the Odyssey Project and work we do in the inner city, uh, whether it's helping parents develop uh, African-American uh, parent advisory councils, uh, to deal with public school systems, whether it's financial literacy courses, whether it's the Music is Life program, we have been doing work. I am consistently moving forward and finding ways to strengthen our communities, one person at a time, one house at a time, one community at a time, one city at a time, until uh, I get as far as I can with the resources I have. I'm asking you to be a part of that. Once again, thank you for watching the preceding uh, video. I thank you for taking the time to listen to us here. Support the Black Man Lead initiative and watch us grow. Once again, thanks and you have an awesome day.